Thank you, Nigel. We have a couple of more speakers who are going to speak to this theme in, um, in voices that supplement what we've just heard, and I think it'll be interesting to fold them into what we're hearing. Our first uh, is uh, Yvette McShan, who will be speaking to us uh, from the heart and her own experience. She also has developed an organization um, and has an office uh, of it, a uh, function of it in Modesto, and we'll speak a little bit about what the focus of that is in the context of her interest in this topic. Yvette. My name is Yvette McShann. I have an organization called Victoria's Black Women. Victoria's Black Women began as an effort to support telling our wellness recovery story. Speaking boldly, we, d we do recover. Victoriously, despite our mental health and substance abuse challenges, we consist of four African-American women doing wellness workshops that consist of dance, telling our stories, sharing poetry, and sharing empowering engagement with attendees, loving on each other as strong women. In 2012, with over 200 members, Victoria's Black Women became a nonprofit organization. Victoria's Black Women's passion is to rebuild the African American family structure that's been virtually destroyed by crack cocaine epidemic and by the infiltrations of guns and marginalized and middle class black communities where I grew up. Victorious Black Women mission is changing one life at a time, changing families, changing communities globally. We counsel one-on-one, -on -one, mentor, hold life skill groups, and we assist with supporting clients in court. We advocate voter and employment empowerment sessions for those of incarceration issues, challenges. Victorious black women feed, clothes, assist with bus fare, help identify funding for identification. That's a big thing with uh, people that's coming home from prison and people that's out in the community that society don't even count and I won't even get into that. Victoria's black women feed clothes itself with bus fare, help I identify funding and make various referrals to address the needs of individuals with emphasis on helping individuals exercise their own voice. In November, of 2004, I was granted a privilege to represent Victoria's black women as a speaker at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. I spoke on use of solitary confinement in prisons. This topic is very personal to me as my brother, my baby brother, Leo McShan, was sentenced to 22 years to life he played a part in as a drug dealer at the age of 16, which occurred 31 years ago. He has now spent majority of his life in Pelican Bay State Prison. Pelican Bay was designed for total isolation confinement for those sentenced to do their time. 
no prison in California was or has been built with this inhumane design. Pelican Bay was also the most notorious prison in California without any accountability. In the late 80s and the mid 90s, mass incarceration of blacks began during the same period. The federal district courts became involved with the abuse case involving staff abuse of inmates at Pelican Bay Prison, triggered by letters and complaints of inhumane conditions. In particular, the case of Midred and Gomez, where Judge Henderson recorded cases of abuse directed at Pelican Bay's inmates. As an African American, an African American, John Dorch, a prison with mental health challenges, was forced to bathe in near boiling water temperatures while guards held him in scalding water, saying, looks like we are going to have a white boy before we're done. Today, Pelican Bay has more accountability. It's be it began moving prisoners into open population where they had none in 205 and has implemented a variety of training programs to provide education for inmates to help change their lives. My baby brother has worked in optical in the kitchen for the last eight years. He has been out of segregated housing unit known as SHU for nearly eight years. And a few months ago, Bug, that's his nickname we call him, was shipped to another prison where he prepared, he's preparing for a parole board at Capitra, a prison in Southern California. It is traumatizing enough to, place, to be placed in isolation for several days at a time, let alone 10 or 20 years. Human beings were born to be sociable beings and to be isolated from others with no personal contact can only traumatize one's soul. I can't imagine how it wouldn't, I can't imagine how it would. I imagine that's my thoughts, that it traumatized a uh, human soul to be locked up in a, a, a a, a room not, no bigger than your bathroom, even smaller than your bathroom in a room to be there for constantly. And the only thing you see is somebody handing you a plate under uh, a wall. And that's, that's the end. You wouldn't do an animal like that. In closing, it is encouraging to see that things are changing we as a country are having really serious di dialogues from the White House, from various groups protesting, and from social media outlets. According, regarding the importance of working towards equality for all, we are demanding an end to racism direct against a particular people and demanding the end of police brutality and deadly force used upon a particular people, we know who those people are. We must advocate for systematic and legislative change, which we do as we exercise our right to vote 
and become active in our communities by getting to know our city and state officials. And as we do, when we encourage members of our community to give a voice to our community's concerns. Victoria's black women advocate that we need to be the voice about us. We as a community need to re represent our own voice. Who know better than us what's going on in our community? And how many of us advocate voting or going to see your city council or getting involved? You know, uh, I know many of you probably didn't hear, well, it don't make no sense to vote. I tell my, my clients and people that I'm involved with, especially those that's uh, involved in uh, parole and probation, I say, you know how it felt to have your first paycheck, especially if you have been on drugs and been hustling and stealing and conniving all your life. When you get your first paycheck, it's like a child at Christmas time and you want it more. And that's how I felt when I started voting. <coughs> I'm um, an ex-con. I've been off probation, I mean parole, since 2005. I've been to school to uh, get my um, associates in human um, services and uh, substance abuse counseling. And what separate me from the people in my community is my family structure. And that's why that's a part of my mission. Even though I allow myself to go out in the world and do my thing, I was taught morals. I seen a mother and father go to work. I seen <laughs> a mother and father that taught me morals and wanted me to go to the best schools or just go to school every day and make something of yourself, you know. And I rebelled against that. And being out in the streets, I seen the difference. People didn't have mother and fathers. And them that did, they didn't have no structure. I believe I came out of a dysfunctional home, but my parents came out of a dysfunctional home and they did the best they, did, they could and they loved me. And, and that's what gives me to, the passion I have today of changing lives and building the African-American structure because before crack cocaine came on the scene, we had a big mama or somebody, a leader in our family. Crack cocaine came in the, in, in the community. And you know, when you think of that, you say, well, it's in the slums. No, it was in a, a, a middle class community. I grew up in Richmond, California, and I promise you, is not the same Richmond that is today. When I grew up in Richmond, California, majority of the people in Richmond, California own their homes. Not only did they own their homes, they had two or three that they own, if not in other states, but in California. But crack cocaine came and changed the game. And you know, I just feel like we get our strength from Jesus Christ and our family. And somehow we got to connect back where we came from. And I just thank you and I wish you all have a blessed day. Yeah. But they have the same opportunity. They may not have business because. Well, I'm sure there. I mean, I used to say, hey, you got the resources, we can tell you what to do, we can tell you where to go. But when you first get out of prison, you have to check that box. 
Right. But right. thank you. Bill's wife in there, the females, he's like, they come in, they didn't have any mental issues, but I You know, I tell my clients, you have to sell yourself. You know, we could, we could use the box as an excuse to, to not press forward. You know, we have to realize we broke the law. And just like we fought to be a drug user, I mean, because I, I, was, I was a proud heroin addict. I promise you I was. And that, that's, that's due to where I come from. My t family taught me how to, to be proud of Max Shans. We stood for something. I just was a dope fan. And I guess because I was a dope fan, I was proud of that. But that's how sick I was, you know. And that's why recovery is so real. Because even when I wanted to recover, I look back. I wanted the boat. I wanted the house. I wanted to go to work every day and quit doing wrong because that hurts that I didn't feel good about that no more. It was fun, it was fun getting high, but it came a time it wasn't fun no more. And in that, you know, I, I, my faith is in Jesus Christ. I prayed for two years and I asked God to take that heroin addiction from me, and he did. And in that, I knew I wanted to start a business, but I knew I had to go back to school. And it wasn't easy, and I had to do that. I mean, we living in, in America, you don't have st stigmas, but you gotta over, you have to push forward. And you know, prime example, you was talking about the box. President Obama, uh, what, last week, is bringing that to legislators. But even with the box, you know, if you can sell yourself, you don't have to worry about the box. If you could sell yourself to an employer and say, no, I'm your best, your best hire, you need to hire me, and give them reasons, they will. Because at the end of the day, they have to teach you what to do anyway. So it's all about selling yourself. And see, we, we, we so easily hold on to things that make us stop and say, well, it, that's not going to work for me. And once you get that in your mindset, that's not going to work for you, it's not. And you have a defeated life. And I don't mean to be so stern, but me being an a African-American woman and with all the disparities I face, I um, don't take no for an answer by anybody. Because, you know, like I said previously, I was taught to be proud. I mean, and, and, and that could be bad, too. That could be bad, too. But, you know, I, I thank my parents for, for instilling value in me. And I, well, all six of us <laughs> embrace that. I can't help it. It's in my bloodstream. I did. I talked about um, isolation, confinement, being inhumane. And what was your response to that? It was it was taken well, and um, you know when you go to the United Nations, it's a process. I mean they're the they they the rules of the land but just because they say something don't mean America going to buy by it you know that's like going out one year doing uh going out one year and saying yeah okay but saying you know I'm not going to do it but that's the thing of the land so you know I my <laughs> I feel good for the opportunity you know, um, I'm a part of uh, United Human Rights, and that's a, um, a global organization. I'm on their t task force, and um, like I said, this uh, this way heavy on my heart. When I was in prison, I wasn't in isolation, but my brother was, and you know, I just that bothered me. You know, because my my brother's getting ready to come home, but a lot of our family members 
had um, bad feelings about that, saying, well, you know, he probably deranged now. But that's why we believe in God, because, you know, only God makes a difference. That's all I know. Yes. With the, the women that come through your organization, mm -hmm. you talked about the family structure. Yes. And so one of the things that I looked at years ago, I talked with the pro office, was about how to reunify the families with those members that were coming out of the prison. Um, and we've been on this probably eight years ago, I presented a program to the uh, California State Department of the World. Um, and actually, they took our program and they're using it now, which is quite interesting. But um, it was unifying the families. So how do you all do that? Because we know a lot of women who go to prison have children. And there's a lot of damage that's done in those children's lives before they leave. There's a lot of damage that's done in the lives of their parents to where a lot of the families don't want them back like you were saying. But our thing was really um, reunifying the mothers with their children and, and um, you know, letting the children know that they're safe with their parent again. So how do you do that? You know, and, and, you, know you, you hear it takes a village, you know, and it takes the school system because I believe any woman that have a baby wants the best for her child, but just don't know how. So a lot of parents need to know how to be parents, you know, uh, and we need to address this, especially, I feel, in education. I'm doing a 10-week uh, session with um, children that has parents that's been incarcerated, and uh, we're trying to we're giving them a voice, but also telling them this is not their fault. And, you know, um, when I, I have to go back to crack cocaine, it was foster care came up, and it was to divide the family. And if you know anybody that went through that ordeal, no, you're not worthy enough, you own drugs. And they divided the children, but in that, you know, you bond to what you come from, even abuse. And the reason I, mean, I, I mention abuse, we need to address that abuse to make them be better. I mean, because, I mean, I was abusive of myself being a heroin addict, but learning I could do better, I did that. And I think, you know, like I said from the beginning, we all want to be the best, best we we want to be the best we can be, but we don't know how, you know? And, and the reason I really believe this is I also work with people with mental health challenges, you know, that people have wrote off. They have dreams, too. And the reason I know this is because I, man I mentored um, six different people. And out of the six, only two went back in crisis to John George. And the other ones are doing okay, connecting with what? Their family, you know? But, you know, we as providers, we need to listen more. And also we need more providers that look like us too. And understanding provide, well, I'm not even gonna get into that. But uh, yes, and I just thank each and every one of you for, uh, listening to me, and you all have a blessed evening.